All right, and the, the final set of assumptions, we're almost ready to actually start answering the question, what happens when I hit enter, and I've already typed Google into my browser's URL bar. We now know that there is some physical path, and we know that there are some rules to be followed for how the routers get their forwarding tables filled out, which will then control how a packet of data goes through the network. There's one more set of assumptions that I want to talk about that has to do with what it actually means to be a computer on the network. So we've talked about routing tables and we've mentioned now an IP address. I want to zoom in for the next section on this area of our chart, the communication that happens between me and my ISP, which is Comcast in this example, before I can be said, you know, this computer over here can be said to be connected to the internet. Okay, so let's zoom in on this section of the graph. Okay, so zooming in here on our local network and Comcast's network, the two important networks, in connecting me to the internet, we've got me on my computer, I'm connected physically to some Wi-Fi router, that router is connected to a modem, that modem is connected, so this is like an ethernet cable, this is Wi-Fi, that modem is connected for me via a cable wire to a box on my telephone, my local telephone post, owned by Comcast, and then this series of boxes and telephone wires ultimately connects into Comcast's network infrastructure. And really, this is the first piece of Comcast's network infrastructure, so maybe I should allow that to include. And this ultimately connects through, who knows, you know, lots of different routers and modems and switches and it's vast. Comcast has built tons of infrastructure in tons of neighborhoods, but there is one important server involved in the process of me getting connected physically and, you know, digitally to the rest of the, the internet. And this server is called a DHCP server a dynamic host control protocol server. Okay, so for me to be connected to the internet, this physical connection is necessary but not sufficient. So not only do I need to have this physical connection so that I can be a part of the several autonomous systems that make up the ultimate internet, I also need an IP address, an internet protocol address, so that other computers in the system can address information to me. So the first step in this process happened a long, long time ago, depending on when you, you know, signed up with your ISP for internet service. You like got on the phone with someone and said, hey, I've plugged in my modem to the cable wire that you told me to, and I paid you $20 or $60 or whatever for my service. Can you please turn on my internet service? And the person on the other line of the phone was like, sure. Your modem's gonna do some blinking lights now and things will change. And one of the most important things that happened then during that process is that you, your modem here, communicated with this Comcast DHCP server to deliver you an IP address. So let's say that IP address just for ease of reading was 90.0.0.1. And that IP address is now associated as far as the external world is concerned that IP address is associated with your local network. Okay, now your local network is probably one like mine where, you know, if your friend comes over, they're also connected to the internet and, you know, maybe you have roommates or family members and they're also connected to the internet via this Wi-Fi router. But it is most likely the case that Comcast only supplied you with one IP address, one public facing IP address. Okay, so the external world sees this 90.0.0.1 address for any of the three of us communicating. And if we do something like open up our terminal and type 
IF config or IP config and try to determine or open our network settings tab and try and determine what our IP address is, chances are all three of us will have something on like the 10 block, say 10.0.0.1 and 10.0.0.2 and 10.0.0.3. Okay, so these are called local IP addresses, and this is a public IP address. And there are a few blocks, you know, commonly the 10 dot anything block and the 192.168 dot anything anything block. These are two blocks of IP addresses that are reserved for use in local area networks. So no matter where you go, you can always have a 10 IP address on any network and then the, the gateway that connects you to the broader internet will have a public IP address, which means we ran DHCP once when our modem turned on, whoever knows how long ago, in order to receive a public facing IP address that connects us to the rest of the internet over here. And when we turned on our computer or when our friends turned on their computer and logged in to our Wi-Fi, you know, put in the password for our Wi-Fi and connect it to our Wi-Fi, the router was acting as a DHCP server at that time to assign you with an IP address. Okay, so something called network address translation runs at the border between, you know, the public IP address over here and the private IP addresses over here that allow us to communicate using this private IP address and allow other people to communicate using this public IP address. And you know this modem at the gateway here has a table that translates. So when it receives some request from 10.0.0.2 and that request reaches it, there's a table that it says, okay, I'm gonna make a mapping between this IP address, this private IP address, and a port number that when someone responds, I'll say 10.0.0.2 is associated with port number 7322. That way, any inbound request bound for IP address 90.0.0.1 with port number 7322 the modem knows to route that, ah, that's actually for 10.0.0.2. And there will be an, an entry in the network address translation table for all of the devices on the local network. Okay, so once we've got an IP address, we can say, finally, we're actually connected to the internet, so we're, we're able to start answering the actual question, what happens after I hit enter when I've typed www.google.com into my browser's URL bar?